Andrew Denning is Associate Professor of Modern European History at the University of Kansas, where he studies mobility, infrastructure, and the environment in 20th century Western Europe. His book, Skiing into Modernity, a Cultural and Environmental History, appeared with the University of California Press in 2015, and he has published articles in American Historical Review, Central European History, Environmental History, Technology and Culture, and the Atlantic. He's currently composing a book-length manuscript uh, on the history of roads and motorization in European empires in Africa, titled Automotive, Automo Automotive Empire, Roads, Mobility, and the Making of Colonial Africa, 1900-1945. So without further ado, please help me welcome, virtually of course, uh, Professor Andrew Denning, uh, who now uh, grace us with a lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwar, and thanks to the Center for Global Humanities. Uh, I, I'll have to apologize to begin here. The, the delay is on my end where I was having issues with the campus IT. Uh, so thanks to everyone for bearing with me. Um, thanks to Neil Jandro and Lucille Smith for helping set up the logistics of this talk. Um, and also, also hello to the uh, students in the classroom in Biddeford, and also to those in the audience and the community in Maine and beyond. I wish I could be there with you. I have really fond memories of Portland. I was there in June a few years back, and I can only assume that the weather is as beautiful in late February in Portland as it is in June. Um, I'm speaking to you tonight from Lawrence, Kansas. And of course, nothing says alpine skiing, which is defined by mountains quite like the Great Plains. But as I'm going to show you today, uh, from here to resorts like Davos and Chamonix and the Alps, uh, or Vail or Killington closer to home. The question of how people experience nature through leisure is a universal one as I want to show you. And so this evening, I'm gonna take you through a number of images drawn from the history of alpine skiing in Europe to help us make sense of the dynamic and interdependent relationship between leisure, nature, and the modern world. And so the question behind all of this is why do people ski? Why are these individuals from the turn of the century in Switzerland skiing? And I think there are as many motivations as there are people. See, for example, this painting from the Austrian Alps in 1931. In the interwar era, uh, particularly in the early 1930s, skiing transformed from a strange pursuit for eccentric enthusiasts or a matter for military planners thinking about defending the frontiers of these Alpine states in Europe into an obsession of mass culture. And I think that we, we have to kind of put ourselves back in the mindset of, of the times before the 30s um, in which I found in my research, people are skiing at night because they're so embarrassed they might be seen by essentially local villagers and made fun of. Um, so they would try and do this under the cover of darkness, essentially. So the fact that it becomes such a big deal um, is really a transformation that I think we have to make sense of. In this image, we see skiers climbing a hill. There's these majestic peaks of Austria's Tyrolean Alps behind them. And we might term this vision of the sport romantic with a capital R. We have these courageous virile men skiing through a sublime alpine landscape, seemingly devoid of human influence. Their faces are obscured by shadows and they're dwarfed by the massive scale of the Alps behind them. And as we might imagine, such a vision appealed to many in interwar Europe as an escape from the crowded and polluted cities into the purity of nature. In this era, critics spoke of alienation of individuals from their authentic selves and from their bodies due to the changing nature of work and the awesome power of modern technology. And so skiing seemed like a perfect prescription for these problems. It combined physical activity and spiritual contemplation in the Alps, seeming to reunite mind, body, and spirit that had been alienated from one another. And I think these kinds of motivations should sound fairly familiar to all of us, because so many of us seek to get away from it all by fishing, skiing, surfing, canoeing out in nature. This painting is also expressing another romantic message. In the mountains, the atomized rat race where every man is out for himself gives way to this sense of comradeship among skiers. They really find that the combination of sport and nature strengthens social bonds that have been strained by urbanization and industrialization. And as so many outdoor enthusiasts know, our activities in nature build bonds with friends and family. Placed in these contexts, this painting suggests that the combination of bodily movement and nature appreciation in interwar skiing was understood as both an escape from the modern world and a return to nature. But I also think this source is not so one-dimensional in its meaning. There's an underlying tension here, of course. Are these skiers and their outdoors brethren communing with nature or are they conquering it? And I think from this image, we can really see that alongside that romantic message is one of triumph, of conquest. Although they're being framed by these alpine peaks, our focus is drawn to the skiers at the front of the frame. 
They reached the crest of the hill thanks to their skis, a triumph of technological ingenuity over snow and slope. And I think that we can really see this based on what they're wearing. They're wearing short sleeve shirts, seeming to mock the extreme climate of the Austrian Alps at high elevations. And so they're working up a sweat, but they're doing so only for pleasure. And we can expect that they're returning to their warm chalets or hotels before night sets in. And as one German ski enthusiast wrote in 1930, because the skier, quote, uncovers and obtains virgin soil, he is a discoverer, a trailblazer, a pioneer, a ski Columbus, a ski Viking, end quote. And as this painting suggests, skiing communicates contradictory messages, often simultaneously. But I think that these tensions actually increase the popularity of the sport. Rather than pulling it apart, uh, they, they send these kind of coherent messages to people in all of these paradoxes. And so this painting really shows us how the sport combines this romantic return to nature and the sense of mastery at the same time. And from its earliest beginnings in the 1880s, alpine skiing was defined by paradox. On the one hand, this was a profoundly simple sport. Two planks of wood were lashed to one's feet and a staff or two poles were used to aid in balance and turning. And this was all that you needed to enjoy the sport's unique mix of nature and speed. Here you see a photograph of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in 1895 in the Swiss Alps, uh, where he actually sort of claims that he helped to invent skiing, which is certainly not true. Uh, but I think that this sense that, that by experiencing it for the first time, he, he seems he's come across something novel, really gives a sense of this kind of discovery and excitement that people had. On the other hand, we have this very simple technology, right? The sport seems to provide limitless potential for related goods and services. You can see all these different kinds of advertisements surrounding the sorts of things that people could purchase while skiing or surrounding skiing. Equipments, clothing, hotels, railways, all of these businesses stood to profit directly from the popularity of the sport, as did locals who provided goods and services to tourists. And so I think one thing that we need to have in mind as we're looking back on the history of skiing from 2021 is we shouldn't fall into the trap of believing that skiing had some kind of golden age of pure, unadulterated nature appreciation before it was somehow corrupted by capitalism and tourism. This in the year before World War I began, 1913 is when this cartoon is from, then and now, uh, which is making this argument about the once pristine nature on top before skiers and then this befouled mountain after the skiers come, all these tracks, the trash, everyone looking the same, right? And they're thinking this in 1913 before we see something like ski lifts even. Um, so I think we can see here that the sport has always depended on its relationship to the mountain landscape, but also its relationship to capitalism and to mass culture at the same time. This is what makes skiing work for people. By the time we get to the 1930s, a few hundred thousand individuals practice the sport regularly in Europe. In the United States, those numbers remain in the tens of thousands until after World War II. But it's during this decade in the 1930s that the sport became really ubiquitous in mass culture. So even if we only have about half a million people skiing across the world, we have tens of millions of people who are really absorbing its messages and coming to, to think of it as something particularly modern and interesting. Resorts and villages continue to entice peer, skiers excuse me, to come practice the sport and to stay in their hotels and eat in their restaurants, while manufacturers marketed all manner of clothing and equipment. But in these years, the association of the sport with speed and with luxury made it an appealing image to market goods entirely unrelated to practicing the sport. I want to show you a few of these. In 1925, the car manufacturer Mercedes-Benz use this association with the skier to say that both in the text here are masters over space and time, right? The skier and the modern automobile are mastering space and time, these seemingly sort of unchangeable factors of modern life. It's used to sell films. Uh, there's this entire genre of the so-called Berg film or mountain film in German speaking cultures in the interwar period of which skiing films were kind of offshoots. Uh, one of the most popular is this one that you see on the left, Der Weisse Rausch. Um, and it really makes the career of a young actress by the name of Lydia Riefenstahl on the right. She's a very famous actress, uh, quite young in these days, uh, as an actress in these Berg Filme. And she eventually comes to be a very accomplished filmmaker in her own right. Her right uh, and she becomes a documentarian of the Nazi regime. She makes the film Triumph of the Will um, and, and becomes someone who is very much associated with this kind of modern cult of the body uh, that in some ways grows out of alpine skiing in these years. And to make this connection clear, here we see Benito Mussolini, skiing used to sell fascism itself, right? This is from Mount Temporanillo, right outside of Rome. Um, and he goes to the mountain one day and is very clear that he wants pictures taken with his shirt off 
in the mountains surrounded by skis so that he can kind of take advantage of this, um, this, this message of skiing as being master over time and space as a kind of masculine form of virility. Um, this is one of the favorite pictures that I came across in my research. Uh, notably, he is not wearing skis, right? So we can imagine him kind of being set up here with all these skis, make sure that the light's good, take the picture, move along, right? He was, he was not known as a good skier, but he wants people in Italy and beyond to see him as a skier because it's important uh, to sort of have that relationship. The number of skiers grows in this interwar period and the technological impacts of the sport also increase. Skiing was a sport that was long dependent on technological innovations, railways, improved bindings, these sorts of things. But things really start to change with the construction of cable lifts, which start to proliferate in the 1930s. And with these, the relationship to the mountain environment that skiers create really undergoes a critical shift. As mountains become cultivated landscapes, and you think of them as almost like farm plots that are engineered to suit the particular needs of alpine skiers for speed, for ease of access, and for safety. And so here we really see that romantic vision of nature colliding with a capitalist logic of trying to maximize profits to recruit more skiers. Lifts attract skiers to resorts. Resorts could stay open longer because those lifts really connect them to higher altitudes where the snow cover lasts late into the spring or even into the summer. After the disruption of World War II and the economic and political shifts that it occasioned, investment in skiing infrastructure grows rapidly. The Austrian government used its Marshall Plan funds from the United States uh, actually to build a number of ski lifts at a number of resorts because they're really investing in their tourism infrastructure after World War II. And these have immense environmental effects. And these environmental effects work to the advantage of both the producers and the consumers of alpine skiing. For those winter stations and the businesses in alpine villages, lifts make very explicit where you're supposed to ski and where you're not supposed to ski, which allows producers to monetize the sport more effectively. One of the most famous incidences of this is the Italian alpine resort of Sestriere, which opens in 1934. And it's the first large scale resort town built entirely for skiing. There was nothing there as of 1932. And suddenly here is this resort in the middle of the Alps by 1934. It benefited from the extension of the freeway from the nearby city of Turin, a purpose-built train station, and the construction of three lifts that allowed skiers to access 74 distinct downhill runs. And so this new resort combines ease of access, convenience, and a variety of skiing opportunities for skiers of various abilities. And we need to see how this is qualitatively different from older alpine ski areas like a place like Davos in Switzerland, for example, because those ski villages are basically existing communities that were divided among a number of different owners, restaurateurs, uh, homeowners, these sorts of things, right? Um, and essentially skiing was grafted on to them, right? They existed before skiing. And so in that era before lifts, this is a, a, one of these towns, Grindelwald in Switzerland, skiers would take to the hills surrounding these established Alpine villages and they'd wander the mountains until they grew tired and returned to their hotel or chalet. And so what you're looking at here is this is the valley of Grindelwald and the mountains kind of move up and down the, the image here. And you can see all of those black dots are, are homes, businesses, buildings, right? So you can see it's very spread out through this valley. Um, and so it's, it's sort of hard to capture the business of these skiers in a place like Grindelwald. In contrast, Places like Sestriere are created from the ground up to serve skiers and to capitalize on their business. It brings lifts, accommodations, and entertainment under centralized ownership in a previously uninhabited landscape. And so as a result of this, we see massive growth. Lifts transported 10 million passengers a year by 1972, including repeat users. And by the end of the 20th century, that number had climbed to over 500 million, half a billion people riding on these ski lifts a year in the Alps. And this gets a very different view of the Alps, right? This is the ski village of Avoriaz in France. You can see these very tall condo buildings in Avoriaz. And if you look at the map here on the right, you can see that the, the sort of footprint of the town is much, much smaller. You have these longer black buildings in the center there. Those are those condos. And then all of these lifts are sort of spraying off in every direction up to the mountain so that people can ski. Um, so this is a much more sort of contained and dense form of alpine development. And the key point of all of these images and points is that ski lifts make the mountains themselves an object of consumption for skiers, and it allows for the monetizing of the mountains in very explicit terms. And this is not forced on skiers, right? The skiers are not saying, no, no, please don't do this. Um, they are actively sort of going along with this. And that's because for the skiers themselves, the lifts are making the sport more attractive by clarifying 
where is an okay place to ski and where is not, where it's safe. Um, it's really removing some of the physical barriers of individual skiers' bodies and also of the mountains themselves to practicing sport. So this is something that's very important in democratizing the sport in Europe and across the world. And so the construction of lifts not only allows for people to get up the mountain more quickly, but it also sanctions certain spaces. It says, here is a safe place to ski. And so this massive investment in infrastructure implies that the landscape is safe and suited to skiing and developers made sure that it was. And the presence of state certified ski instructors and meticulously groomed runs delineated by skill level, uh, the, the famous sort of color and shape all the way up to black diamond, right? Um, this suggests that alpine skiing is a sport for all ages and ranges of experience. So you can have the, the near pro going down the black diamond and you can have your kids on the bunny hill learning how to ski all in the same place, right? We can see what this looks like in a resort like Teen in France. This is from the 1980s. And you can see the, the base here where there's the village. Uh, you can see all the lifts going up and then the delineation um, by color of essentially how difficult these runs are. And so by eliminating the need for a taxing uphill climb, lifts made the sport considerably easier to practice and more alluring to those who might have otherwise avoided the sport for reasons of physical fitness, right? You don't have to be the ski Viking or the ski Columbus anymore to enjoy some time on the weekend skiing in the Alps. And so we need to see how lifts turn ski runs into the mountain equivalent of highways. Both drivers and skiers enjoy the freedom of controlling their motion, but that motion is very much bounded and channeled by infrastructure, right? And you can see what this looks like um, from an image like this, Meyerhofen in Austria. You can see the lifts going up the left side of the image here, avalanche fencing to prevent uh, avalanches from occurring and, and washing away the infrastructure or hurting individuals. You can see the groomed ski run down the center there. Um, the little bits of orange there kind of to the right of the ski run from what we're seeing, those are plastic fences that basically uh, prevent people from flying off the edge into the trees there. Um, so all of this is showing that um, here are the places where it's safe to ski. Um, we can see that this requires a lot of um, sort of of construction and then maintenance by those who run these ski resorts. And the effects of this are immense. People are able to ski more and for longer. Um, and so this, this really allows for people to make more money off of skiing and for the skiers who enjoy their sports to practice it longer and more often. If skiing is made possible by mountains and snow, I think it's little wonder that other than building lifts, the major development after World War II is the manipulation of snow. Snow is both a blessing and a curse for the post-war ski industry because snow alone is not enough to maintain profitability. It needs to fall in the right places at the right times in order to sustain those huge investments made in infrastructure and in the service sector. Uh, I am from northern Nevada. Uh, Nevada, as you know, is a desert. It also is directly abuts uh, Lake Tahoe, where there are amazing ski uh, resorts. And, and this was a problem every year, right? How do you make enough snow at the right time in a desert? And I think that this really typifies uh, the problems that ski resorts deal with, which is they, they need snow in the right places at the right times. The technological manipulation and eventual production of snow made the practice of alpine skiing more reliable for producers and consumers alike. And the most dramatic example of this in my mind, occurred in 1964, in advance of the Winter Olympics in Innsbruck, Austria. In early 1964, the Austrians had this impossible dilemma. They were about to host the Olympics in a few weeks, and this is what the mountains looked like in January of 1964. Green, not enough snow, um, and so they they'd had all of these years of meeting and organizational um, sort of development, and all of these investments could not guarantee the one thing they needed, which was snow. So unlike the regulated ice rinks of hockey or skating, skiing events were at the mercy of natural, excuse me, natural, convent, condi, excuse me, natural conditions. And so they have to fix this problem, right? Beginning on January 9th, they brought together hundreds of army reservists to transport snow to the competition sites from a snow rich Alpine Valley at a much higher elevation, about a 40 kilometer drive on very dangerous Alpine roads. Nearly 1,000 soldiers worked over three weeks to load trucks with snow and distribute it over the alpine skiing courses. So they repeatedly load and unload 115 trucks um, to cover those competition sites with a bed of six to eight inches of snow. This came to be known colloquially as the so-called miracle of Innsbruck, a logistical feat that assured the success of the Winter Olympic Games. More generally, this man-made miracle really epitomized this post-war shift in the relationship between skiers and the Alps. And so although it began as this improvised reaction to the lack 
lack of snow. The end result for skiers and for organizers was in fact a race course that was better suited to alpine skiing competitions than natural snow. And we have skiers who, who competed here saying, wow, this is the best course I've ever raced on. How, how did you do it, right? And what they do is they are able to build these ski runs literally from the ground up, right? So rather than having to deal with snow that fell two weeks earlier and started to melt and froze and then new snow fell on top of that, they're essentially building this as they need to, to make it uh, last as long as possible and to make it as fast as possible. So these are uncommonly uniform. There aren't sort of um, slippery spots or soft spots based on where the snow is hitting or where there's shade. Um, and they are also quite secure. So the skiers are much less worried about hurting themselves essentially. And so I think that this example really shows us that the increasing profitability and popularity of the sport over the course of the 20th century did not sever the bond between skiers and nature, but it recast it, right? They're still dependent on snow. And even in these seemingly manufactured landscapes, um, this dependence on the natural environment remains. And so a lack of snow we see can still doom a business venture or an international event such as the Olympics. And so, unsurprisingly, ski resorts were not inclined to leave snow up to nature, and they started to invest in technologies to produce it artificially. The invention of the so-called snow cannon in 1950 held out the promise that resort operators could mitigate nature's deficiencies through their own ingenuity. Over subsequent decades, engineers tinkered with these snow cannons to make them viable on the huge scale that was needed to put them into use at large resorts. And so they started to be installed widely in the 1980s. And just one of the examples here is the French resort of Les Menuilles, um, which I think really typifies this wholesale adoption of snow cannons at Alpine resorts. This resort possesses an automated system of some 188 snow cannons, which are coordinated with one another. And this is obviously an incredibly resource intensive process that uses immense amounts of water and energy. But it allows the operators to cover eight kilometers of ski runs with artificial snow, thus guaranteeing snow security and lengthening the season perceptibly. By the early 2000s, approximately 30% of all ski slopes in the Alps could be treated with artificial snow. And at many of the largest and most profitable resorts, more than 80% of those slopes can be artificially maintained. And so the image that you see here, which is from a ski magazine in France in the 80s, I think really demonstrates this cumulative effect of all of the various infrastructures and technological developments I've been talking about here. You can see how ski lifts and snow cannons combine to prolong the ski season by connecting uh, the winter stations that exist at lower elevations with the snow of the higher elevations, both at the beginning and at the end of the season. So this allows people to start skiing maybe earlier in November and keep skiing into April, May, June, rather than having the season over as temperatures rise. And so although we see weather conditions still being able to harm business, improved access to higher elevations through ski lifts and the ability to produce snow at will place the ski industry on firmer financial footing. So as I wrap up here, I, I want to think about, um, you know, what does this mean as we move into the 21st century? I think paradoxically, the technologies that were meant to grow the sport and guarantee its profitability and democratize it undermined its appeal for some, which returns us to the question of motivations. Why do people ski? The alpine nature that was presented at Europe's ski resorts was conspicuously managed and manipulated. So it's certainly not some vision of a pristine wilderness any longer, if it ever was. Sectors of the Alps seem to exist only to serve winter tourists, leading to sprawl and overcrowding. And it's probably hard to see on this map here, but basically each of these small red dots on the map represents a ski resort, some 500 in the Alps today. And so to summarize what we've been talking about here, the magnitude of human interventions in mountain landscapes has grown, but the fundamental dependence of skiing on snow in the mountains remains constant. The question now, of course, is whether the undeniable effects of climate change will render the idea of ski resorts as solid investments fanciful in the future. And so although many critics have argued that alpine skiers have become estranged from nature in the post-war era, the effects of global warming demonstrate that the technology has only transformed the sport's dependence on nature, not eliminated it. The question today is whether climate change will eventually eliminate the intimate connection between skiers and the Alps. Here you see, uh, separated by 108 years, uh, the Mer de Glace glacier uh, on Mont Blanc, which shows how much um, melting and, and how different the, the conditions are today than they were a century ago. Artificial snow can shore up operations at the margins, but they can't replace natural snow on a large scale for an entire season or indeed for many seasons in a row. And so in fact, in 2017, the Swiss government released a report expressing its confidence that even if winter tourism declined in response to lack of snow, they were convinced that the heating of the Mediterranean coast would make it 
essentially uncomfortable for people to vacation there in the summer. So they think that they're going to benefit from summer vacationers who used to go to the French Riviera or the Italian coast instead will come to the Swiss mountains once again. And so this I think shows us that while the mountain tourism economy might adapt to survive, the sport of skiing may not. Nevertheless, the social and economic fabric of the Alps will continue to bear the imprint of skiers' relationships with the mountains. Whether they commune with nature or they conquer it, whether they leave no trace or approach landscapes as consumers, skiers' experiences and desires have transformed the mountains that their sport depends on. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back to Anwar here, and I look forward to hearing his and your questions. Thank you, Andrew. This is fascinating. This is a rapid, rapid delivery of a very uh, complex treatment of, of skiing and, and the Alpine and, uh, and the relationship between uh, capitalism and tourism and, 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 the, and this sport, all of which, of course, didn't get fair treatment in this very short period of time. I know, I'm so sorry about the, uh, we don't no. have enough time to treat all of these issues that, that are all raised beautifully and in depth in your book. So uh, we have a number of questions. We will start with the students uh, who are now uh, waiting to ask questions. Uh, we will go to Sharina uh, Balaparia, who is a major in medical biology. She's a pre-PA. Go ahead, Sharina. Hi. Hi. I would Hi. like to thank you on behalf of our class in the university for your engaging lecture on alpine skiing. We really enjoyed your book and learning about the history of skiing in the Alps and how it changed our modern world. I would like to learn more about the class division within the sport. Upon reading your book, we learned that skiing began as a lower class activity, but through its evolution, it became a higher class sport with middle class association. What aspects of the sport led to this class jump? Thank you, Sharina, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I think it's the, the class question is a really interesting one, right? Um, I mentioned these, these individuals who were afraid to be seen practicing the sport and so they would ski at night, right? And so these, these first people who start to practice the sport um, are actually generally, um, members of the kind of upper middle class, often from Britain. Uh, so they, they love their time in the Alps between May and September. And they're saying, man, what, what could we do if we could just stay in the Alps over the winter as well? Um, and so this is one of the things that they, they end up taking to. Um, and so, of course, you know, they, they're doing this for a good time. Um, and the people who live in these resort towns um, are saying, well, we could probably make money off of this. There are these very rich people who seem to like this. And so they take up the sport. Um, a lot of them, as you sort of alluded to here, use the use skis for very utilitarian means, right? So they're using it for their traditional practices of cutting timber, for example, um, of getting between some of these alpine communities in the winter. Um, and so in doing this, we have essentially very quickly a generation of people who are, are born in the Alps uh, in these small villages um, who they say are born with skis on their feet basically, right? So in the same way that if you learn to ride your bike when you're two years old, if you learn to ski when you're two years old, suddenly you're, you're very proficient when you're five or six. Um, and by the time we get to say 1920 or 1925, um, any of these international races or events are almost always won by relatively poor um, young men from these Alpine villages, right? Um, and so that's where we get this kind of, you know, the, the, the skiers are often sort of lower class um, residents of the Alps at the beginning. Um, but we really see this shift, I think, as this becomes a kind of um, vision of mass culture and a, and a very luxurious one, right? I think that there's this tension in this, um, this culture of skiing in which um, it's for everyone, right? It's, it's mass, um, but it, it always seems to represent this kind of luxurious view of things. And so if we look at the things that are being sold here, um, everyone is very nicely dressed, right? We can see that this is this is the kind of um, middle class outing that people might want to take part in. Um, so I think it's always very aspirational. Um, and the fact that it was practiced in the 1920s and 30s, largely by members of the upper middle class who could afford to go to these areas for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, um, meant that once we start to see economic growth in Europe and in the United States after World War II, um, and people are able to take part in these leisure kinds of activities, um, they say, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what rich people do, right? Rich people go on trips to the Alps over Easter for two weeks, and so we need to do that as well. And that's where we really start to see this differentiation um, in, the, the, um, in the market between the kind of upper and lower, right? Uh, so in the same way that, you know, 
people can drive Ferraris and they can drive Honda Civics. Um, so too, you might go to kind of the, the weekend place you can drive from your, your home in Munich or your home in Paris, or you might go to a place like Davis or Stad, uh, where you, know, you will be seen and be seen among uh, kind of the elites of Europe and of the world. Um, and so I think it, it's a very interesting kind of sport that in being so simple, um, and being so sort of universal in these landscapes around the Alps means that it can, can be a kind of lower middle class thing um, for, for people who live in these communities, or it can be uh, the kind of place where, you know, Russian oligarchs and, you know, the, the, the children of the, the Hilton family uh, will meet in a place like Davos, and, and this will be kind of the height of luxury. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it, it's a very complicated question because um, I've, I've um, in some reviews of my work, um, in, in some discussions with, with people at talks, they say, oh, you know, um, this isn't a middle class, it's upper class. It's, it's too luxurious, it's too expensive, right? And so I think um, it depends on where you're skiing and how you're skiing and, and you know, what you're skiing for. Sometimes it's for like the, the après ski fun at the disco and, and um, going to these nice restaurants and shopping at Louis Vuitton. And other times it's to go out with your family and, um, you know, kind of just be out in nature. So there's, it's a sport that really has, um, I think, lots of ways to be a skier and, and that brings lots of different groups. So yes, thank you very much, Serena. Wonderful question. Thank you. Before we get to the next question by another student, I want to, I want to, and I want to ask on behalf of a member of the Center for Global Humanities and Honorary Fellow, Tom Patterson, who, who's wondering uh, whether, you know, whether those, the descendants of those who embrace the introduction of skis still feel the same way since their homeland has been overrun with commercialism and tourists. A very similar history as, uh, in, in, uh, is unfolding in the state of Maine, where the summer tourist is needed for their economic stimulus and detested for the changes they bring. How would right. you, yeah. Better. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question, Tom. It's a very interesting one. And I think, you know, there's there's always this dynamic of insider outsider. Um, and so from the, from the early developments of alpine skiing, um, I, I think we need to see how incredibly poor the Alps were, right? So I, there are all these sources that I have from the 1890s through the 19 teens, basically, uh, basically saying that, that Alpine residents would essentially have to hibernate. Um, it was so cold, it was so dark, um, they would they would kind of, you know, huddle in on themselves and certainly not hibernate like a bear, but they, they would really have to kind of live this, I would say, a vita minima, right? They did have to kind of go into this um, protective shell and, and live off the things, the cheeses that they made in the summer, for example, the, the things that they'd saved up. And so, this, this kind of development of, of seemingly free money from very rich people who want to give it away is, is very much welcome, right? It, it creates, I think, a kind of rhythm to, to economic life in the Alps. They've already been catering to um, summer guests at this point, although winter guests require much more infrastructure. Um, they often spend more money, spend more time. Um, and so this is all, all deemed a benefit to them, right? Um, and so I think a, a lot of the kind of complaints have come in the post-war years where there is this sense that things have been overbuilt, right? And you have this vision of um, just, just huge um, condo buildings and these, these stacks of skis, right? Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's in some ways, this is the outcome of, of a successful industry, right? I think we need to see skiing as an industry, a, a leisure industry that makes billions of dollars for people across the world. Um, and now Alpine communities are richer on average than lowland communities in Europe uh, and throughout the EU. So I think this is the sort of thing that, you know, it, these are beautiful places and there are lots of people there and there's pollution and there's overbuilding. And so um, I think that it can often, um, it, it's a sign of convenience that, that people can afford to live there and not freeze to death in the winter any longer and then com complain about the outsiders, right? But I certainly understand, um, I think this is a dynamic that you see and the Rockies, you certainly saw it around like Tahoe, where I grew up, and, and I know it happens in Maine as well. And, and one of the most recent books I read is, is John Hodgman's book, A Vacation Land, about um, his home up in, in Maine and the kind of dynamics of insiders versus outsiders and, and where he finds himself in this kind of in-between space. So um, yes, it's a great question. I think that the social dynamics, again, are, are, are really fraught in the sport of skiing and all these surrounding activities of, of development in particular. Gabby Sacco, uh, uh, who is a medical biology major, has a question for you. Gabby? Hi. Um, in the book, uh, you mentioned the issue of gender in the world of skiing. Do you think the issue still occurs in a different way? 
If you, if so, um, what are some critical changes that you feel would be necessary to have the global societies change its view of gender in and outside of the world of sports? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think um, for, the, for the members of the audience who didn't get a chance to, to read the book, um, I can kind of give a quick sketch of this. Thank you, Gabby. Um, that um, essentially, you know, when the sport's developing in the late 19th and early 20th century, sport is not something that women are meant to do according to kind of middle-class uh, tastemakers, right? And, and many times men uh, expecting to keep women in their place, their kind of uh, private realm of the home, the so-called angel in the house, this very Victorian view of things, right? Um, but there are certainly women who are upholding and, and kind of putting these ideas out there as well. And so what they find in skiing is that skiing seems to be um, this kind of Goldilocks activity, which is, is something that people want to do and is very modern, but it's also in its kind of kinesthetics, the movements, it's very fluid, it's very graceful, right? And so this is not seen as the kind of um, muscle bound jerky movement of something like riding a bike, of hiking up the mountains, of boxing, these sorts of sports that are deemed unwomanly. And so this kind of creates a space for women to practice the sport. And it's, it's one um, that women are very active in for uh, at a very early time, right? Um, and so we see women um, contesting Olympic events in the 1930s. Um, but I think what you're alluding to here is, is in the post-war, um, women are certainly practicing the sport. And we see women in particular being sexualized through the sport of skiing, right? The so-called ski bunny um, and the idea that, um, you know, I think as, as part of this larger culture that surrounds skiing, um, that women are part of this kind of... Um, that essentially when skiing in the Alps or, or in any mountain space, you're sort of away from the concerns of everyday life and that this, this leads to a kind of um, lightening of inhibitions. And, and of course, when we're talking about that kind of message, oftentimes women stand for that, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that we see, especially in the 60s and 70s, this, this very um, sort of hyper-sexualized vision of women in the sport. Um, and I think this real divide between um, women athletes and, and women who are sort of leisure skiers, right? I think the, the woman leisure skier is, is sexualized in this way as a ski bunny um, and women athletes, I think sort of exist in this separate realm. And so something I talk about in the book um, is that um, anytime we're seeing visions of, of women in advertising for ski resorts, for equipment, for these sorts of things, um, they're usually around skiing, but they're not shown skiing because there's a worry on the part of the advertisers that showing a woman skiing is, is somehow making her less attractive, right? Um, and there are very few, I think, um, sort of pieces on, on women skiing athletes um, that, that sort of see them as anything other than sort of high efficiency athletes. And so I think that something that we've seen change in the last couple of decades um, is, is a blending of some of these things. And then we've seen um, individuals like Lindsey Vaughn, for example, kind of rise as both um, gold medalist alpine skiers, but I think also um, sort of targets of advertising and, and very much being presented as sort of a sex symbol, right? Um, and so I think in some ways that distinction has melted away, but I think that the, the the gendered nature of this, of who gets to ski and why, and that um, the, the representations of women in skiing, I think are, are, are very much different. And I think this goes hand in hand with um, this, this very sexualized sort of culture of, of advertising and, and capitalism in particular. Yeah, so I think that's, um, it remains a really active question and, and one that I think I, I found most interesting about um, doing this research, because I think that you, you can really sort of trace the um, the, the, the peaks and valleys, the ways that this is changing over time as kind of societal mores change. So yeah, great question, Gabby. Thank you. I have a question from Francesco Duina, he, uh, from my friend and colleague. At, uh, he's a professor of sociology at Bates College here in Maine. And, he, you know, I'm going to read one of his questions. I'm going to actually quote. He says, I wonder if you can say more. By the way, he says, what a great book. Just a few questions. Uh, for, in, in other words, from someone, uh, from an avid skier who grew up at the feet of the Alps and now lives in Maine but has skied all over. So we're talking here, to, we are talking about a very, um, um, very so maybe semi-professional, maybe a, a very serious amateur uh, skier. He says, I wonder if you can say more about the management of risk. Modern societies often sell us and experience a calculated exposure to risk sometimes even fake risk. Think theme restaurants with fake dinosaurs or the like, or horror movies. Does this idea apply here as part of the modern experience of skiing? Skiing certainly is actually risky. 
yet it is also highly artificial in some ways, lifts, fake snow, etc., and often it's fairly safe. To what extent uh, do you think it amounts to a somewhat calculated exposure to risk, a plane with risk in a very modern sense? Yeah, thank you, Francesco. It's a great question, I think. And, and I think, um, you know, this this falls into the realm of, of what we see emerging, particularly in the, I guess, sort of counterculture, late 60s, but we see really blooming in the 70s and 80s of so-called extreme sport, right? Uh, and the idea of mountain sport as potentially extreme sport. And I think this really comes about um, particularly in that moment where skiing is so popular and so ubiquitous that that there needs to be more differentiation, right? Um, the, the, the kid who likes punk music can't be doing the same sport the same way as his grandpa did 40 years ago, right? And so I think we start to see this, this real um, sort of uh, diversification of the market in some ways. Um, so you get more extreme ways of skiing as a way of kind of proving one's um, courage, masculinity. Um, I think that you're absolutely right, Francesco, that's, that there is a kind of um, selling of this image of danger, right? Um, and, and that, you know, steep mountain passes and, and black diamond runs and, you know, the, the clothing company, black diamond, the equipment company, black diamond says, you know, we make things for the most dangerous and the most serious of undertakings on the mountain. Um, so I, I think that, you know, the, the ideal of the ski industry, if I'm thinking about, you know, the group that manages the veil in Colorado, or for example, um, is, is to sort of heighten this sense of perceived risk while managing as much as possible behind the scenes so that there are no broken legs and no people stuck in the, the, the out of bound zones who might freeze overnight. I mean, that's, that's where they want to be, right? They, they want to be sure that it um, seems dangerous enough to kind of pull in um, people and, and, and have this kind of free zone of, of danger um, while not actually endangering anyone. But I think, you know, on the other hand, it, it remains a very dangerous sport. I, I mean, you can, um, you know, lose your footing or, or look the wrong direction at the wrong time and, and people run into trees, they, they end up out of bounds, they get stuck in blizzards. I mean, it, it can be very dangerous, I think. And so I think, yeah, these, these companies are very much kind of tiptoeing this line between, um, you know, benefiting from that sense of danger, but trying to manage it, manage it, excuse me, out of existence. And so something I didn't talk about much um, in the talk, but is in the book, um, is the way that they really start to kind of groom the mountains themselves to remove rocks and divots and tree stumps and all these sorts of things to make this just kind of, um, you know, vanilla homogenous mountain um, that, that is perfectly suited to safe skiing, safe, fast downhill skiing. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you. Josie Brown, she's a nutrition major, has a question for you. Hi, um, I was super interested in learning what really prompted you into writing Skiing into Modernity. Are you a lifelong skier? Do you enjoy skiing? Kind of just what led up to the development of you writing the book? Thank you, Josie. That's a great question. Um, I am not a skier. Uh, and I think that this is something that I've, I've, always kind of felt embarrassed about when I'm, I'm asked about it because um, there, there's a kind of politics in history when, you know, people study, you know, important things, economic, political, et cetera. Um, you know, I've, I've written articles about the Nazis and no one says, oh, are you a Nazi or do you like the Nazis, right? But I think when, when people write books on leisure or celebrity or sports, um, there's an assumption that it kind of grows out of, um, out of one's own experiences. I can say that although I'm not a skier, this is something that grew out of my experiences. Um, so I grew up in Reno, Nevada. Um, Reno is at about a, close to a mile elevation. It's high desert. Uh, I mentioned Lake Tahoe. That's about 30 to 45 minutes away. Um, my parents were from San Diego. They moved there before I was born, uh, up to Reno before I was born. And we're kind of lower middle class. Um, you know, we, we didn't want for anything, but we weren't planning week-long trips to Vail to go skiing, certainly. And so what I found is um, everyone I knew skied who had families that were from Reno and had grown up there, right? That that, that was kind of what you did. Um, my family didn't ski because my parents grew up in San Diego and, and for class reasons, there was not this kind of like, oh, well, it's, it's something to be done, right? This is something you should be doing. And so I had a number of friends in, in middle school and high school who were essentially kind of rising semi-pro skiers. They were, they were very good. Um, they were missing school to, to go to competitions and to train. Um, and 
even those who didn't, I had lots of friends who were just kind of, you know, leisure snowboarders on the weekend. Um, and I came to realize, you know, there's something going on here that I don't really understand, but I, I also kind of understand it from being proximate to it. Um, and so I think that that was the kind of mystery at the core of this, which is like, I, I want to know why people do this and how they do it. Um, and then I was, I was very much kind of a summer mountain kid. I mean, that's, that's what we did is we would go hiking and camping and fishing and these sorts of things. Um, and so I was always really interested in what I would see in the summer mountains, which is, um, you know, they don't pack away the infrastructure between April and October. Like you, you still see all of these cutouts of trees and you see the lifts and you see the hotels that are now empty. And, you know, the, the condo that would be $400 in February is $40 a night and there's no one else in the building in June. Um, and so I think these dynamics were always really interesting to me. And I, I just love the mountains as well. And um, I can tell you that if, if you're ever doing Archival, archival research. Um, I highly recommend, you know, picking a, a beach community or a mountain community to, to focus on rather than, um, you know, the, the homesteaders of Oklahoma or something as, as nice as Oklahoma can be. So yeah, I think it was, it was a very personal project for me in a lot of ways. Um, okay, uh, in the, as we wait for the next student to, to ask a question, uh, you know, you talked about gender, but uh, uh, Francesco has another question too related to race. Um, it says going back to the U.S. and Europe, for that matter, and thinking about race. To what extent is skiing a white sport? Why is it the way it is, and what does it say about race construct and experiences more broadly? Yeah, that's a great question, Francesco. I think um, you know, in the in the European context, this is less salient because the the questions of race arising in Europe come relatively later um, with well, oftentimes people um, emigrating to European states from the former empire. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's becoming more salient there, but I think we've really seen in the United States in particular um, after World War II, there's a, a great book um, and, and associated article by a historian, Annie Gilbert Coleman. She's based at Notre Dame. Um, and she has the best title of an academic article I've ever heard, which is called The Unbearable Whiteness of Skiing. Um, and it's about race in these Colorado resorts. And what she finds is that um, these Colorado resorts in particular, like Steamboat, like Vail, um, really play up nativeness uh, of the West, right? The idea that kind of cowboy skiers and that it's, it's, it's uh, the frontier, uh, this kind of wild West vision of things that is very much dependent on, in particular, Native American cultures. Um, and then it's very dependent on the labor of um, generally Latino um, individuals living in these areas. But that the people skiing in the 60s and 70s are, are really white, right? I mean, this is incredibly white practice of sport. Um, and so I think really looking at how, you know, the, the whiteness of skiing is itself a construct. And I think, you know, there are a number of organizations working in the United States to diversify skiing. I think there's a recognition um, that's, that, you know, skiing does have a kind of, uh, I think, old school, stayed and backwards um, reputation in some ways these days. I think there's, you know, the cool kids go to snowboarding um, and, and skiing seems like the thing your grandpa does. And I think there's this real recognition that's, that the whiteness of skiing is increasingly a problem in a um, increasingly diverse United States. Um, and so I think that's, you know, part of it was, it was, it was deliberately, I think, racially exclusive for some time. Um, and then I think, you know, because of the way culture works, and I mentioned my own experience, um, kids whose parents didn't ski are less likely to ski. Um, kids who don't live near ski areas and, and, you know, there are not large populations of non-white people living near Killington, Vermont, for example. Um, these are places that are hard to get to. And, and so, you know, you have to want to get there and you're probably not going to um, just try and figure it out and throw $2,000 at equipment and places to stay to see if you like skiing, right? Um, so I think this is, this is very much a, a sort of pressing question for the sport of skiing moving forward is it's, it's seeming whiteness and it's kind of um, aging image. Great question, Francesco. Thank you. So Peyton Barker, she's a medical biology major, has a question for you. Hi. So uh, in your lecture tonight, you mainly discussed alpine skiing, but in your book, you kind of discussed the fight and differences between Nordic and alpine skiing. So my question was, what types of values do you think are intrinsically tied to Nordic skiing versus alpine skiing? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, thank you. Did I hear Caden with a K? P, with a P. The P, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is this is a question that um, 
you know, I, I, I talk here only about alpine skiing and, and I think the, the background that you're alluding to that I talk about in the book is that uh, before there wasn't alpine skiing and Nordic skiing, there was just skiing and it was Nordic skiing, right? Um, and so what you had was skiers coming from Scandinavia, um, generally from Norway and Sweden. Um, a lot of them actually ended up in the United States out in the, the gold rush in uh, California, Nevada as well. So they bring it with them there. Um, but basically skiing starts to take on this very kind of um, romantic nationalistic tone particularly in Norway, as they're trying to kind of differentiate themselves from the kingdom of Sweden that they're, they're living under in the 19th century. So in like the 1850s or so, they start to say, this is the thing that we do. We ski. It, it sort of connects us to our home environment, to the mountains around us. And skiing at that time, obviously, no lifts, um, means you climb as far as you want to descend, right? And so it is this much more sort of Nordic style of um, climbing and flats and, and short descents. And so that is the way that they practice the sport. They eventually bring it to continental Europe. Um, a lot of these Norwegians are students in various, particularly German uh, mining and engineering schools. And they practice this on the weekends and basically people around them say, oh, this looks fun, we should try this. And that's where we start to get people in Central Europe picking it up. And there's this huge divide between Nordic skiing and Alpine skiing. Um, Nordic skiing re retains these kinds of very romantic connections to the landscape the sense that you're going slowly, that you're you're sort of taking in the environment, that you're, um, there's also, I think, something very, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, sort of self-sacrificial about it, right, that um, that that it's hard, that you, it's, it's like endurance running, right, you, you really have to kind of suffer to, to enjoy the sport and to, to get to know the landscape you're skiing through. And so a lot of these Nordic skiers see the Alpine skiers and they say, oh, you know, these, these guys are, are just lazy. All they care about is the speed, they're flashy. Um, and so I, I think that you really get this kind of divide between a sort of contemplative, slower form of Nordic skiing and this flashy, um, you know, implicitly kind of capitalistic and wasteful form of Alpine skiing. And so I think, you know, we might see this as it's obviously kind of constructed and very binary. It's, it's not so simple as this, but I think it's in many ways similar to the, the kind of debate between fast food and slow food, right? That, that by choosing slow food, you are making a choice that says, I, I respect the work that goes into this. I'm, I'm mature. I don't care about how fast it comes out. And I think that that's in many ways, the kind of ethos of, of Nordic skiing. And so um, once we see Alpine skiing becoming so popular in the post-war years, um, a lot of people who think that Alpine skiing has become too materialistic, too um, commodified, too advertised, actually will turn to Nordic skiing as the kind of simple choice, right? The, the idea that I'm doing it the right way. I am connecting with nature. Um, I'm choosing this kind of slow food movement of skiing. So I think there's always this kind of back and forth between um, Nordic skiing and Alpine skiing that I think represent these, these very um, binary and opposite things. While in fact that, you know, many skiers kind of engage in the in-between spaces. But I think they, they stand symbolically for these very different ways of doing things. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll wait for the next student to, to take up, ask the question. Yeah, this is Emily. Emily, am I pronouncing your right, name correctly, Susie? Yeah. Okay, Emily Susie, she's a medical biology major. She has a question for you. Um, hi. So my question is, do you think that the current pandemic has allowed skiing to turn back into a leisure activity or form of escape rather than a competitive activity? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I think it depends. Emily. I think that, um, you know, in, in some ways for a lot of people, it's, it's made it such that if you want to ski, um, you can't go to the resorts. You need to go to, you know, the the local forest or to um, a sort of hill and neighborhood or, or, you know, down the road if you want to practice the sport. And it's it's um, less groomed, it's less slick, and it's it's much more, you know, we might say organic, right? Um, and I think that a lot of this has to do with the fact that, um, you know, some some of these ski areas are not operating at all because it's just so hard to figure out how you get people to stand close together in a pandemic and, and you know, wait to get up the, the lifts and to be in the places where they eat and all of this. Um, but I also think that there, there is this, this larger sense that we're seeing in our society as a whole globally um, of, you know, maybe this is a chance to sort of reflect on um, 
you know, how, how much things have hypertrophied, how much we've overbuilt and overdone things. And, and so I do think that there is um, this, this kind of sense of, of returning to something simpler for some skiers. Although I think, um, you know, if slash when we come out on the other end of this, certainly um, people are wanting going to want to get back to the resorts and, and people are going to want to pay their money to go back to them. And, and so, um, yeah, I think one of the interesting questions would be how, how lasting is this kind of turn, right? I, I'm seeing a lot of this in my home community where um, I, I'm in the market for a new gravel bike and, and I'm on Craigslist and I'm seeing everyone who bought one in April of 2020, uh, realizing that they don't really care to ride their bike anymore. And so I think, um, you know, trying to figure out how, how many people will be uh, will remain committed to this perhaps slower or more natural form of skiing and, and how many are seeing it as merely a kind of temporary solution to a problem of, of they actually prefer this this kind of downhill skiing is I think it's a great question. Thank, Thank you. Emily. Yes and um, Andrew who is probably now getting seated has uh, Progen, Andrew Progen from uh, he's a major in sports management uh, has a question for you. Uh, hello, and thank you uh, for coming to talk to us today. Uh, my question uh, is more about the popularity of like skiing and winter sports. And it was, do you see the Winter Olympics expanding to the size of the Summer Olympics um, in comparison of the countries participating? Because it's, I think the numbers were 92 countries participate in the Winter Olympics compared to 206 in the summer. Yeah, I mean, this is such a question that that's, I think, really been bedeviling uh, proponents of skiing and, and the IOC for decades, right? Um, is, you know, how, how popular can these sports be if people don't play them, right? I mean, I, I'm very interested in, in sports that I have never and will never played. Uh, but I think that, you know, the question is, you know, will, will people who live in Southeast Asia where they're sim simply skiing is impossible, um, you know, will they watch skiing events at the next Winter Olympics? And, and I'm sure, you know, there are examples of those who do, but, but fundamentally, um, you know, will there ever be a, a ski team from Vietnam? Um, probably not, right? Um, and so I think that this is something that I really saw when I was doing some research at the International Olympic Committee archives um, in Switzerland. There's a, a very famous head of the IOC, Avery Brundage, an American, uh, who hates skiing. He cannot stand skiing. Um, he is really sort of, he's an, an Olympic athlete in the interwar era. Um, he is, um, very committed to this idea of amateurism, um, that, you know, there can be no crossover between making money off of one sport and practicing that sport. And so he's looking at these skiers in the fifties and sixties and just saying like, these people are essentially like walking billboards. Right. And he's constantly dealing with these problems of, um, of sort of professionalization of skiers. And, you know, does it matter that Jean-Claude Keely from France um, you know, had a, a sort of share in a hotel in his, his Alpine village, you know, that, that's kind of making money off his sport. Um, and, and he essentially just tries to uproot it all. He's I, in the archives, you can see there are all these arguments behind the scenes where he's basically saying, um, let's just try and get rid of the Winter Olympics entirely, that, that, that we should not be having these, right? Um, and so I think there is this sense that, um, that he's doing this because it's commercial, but he also thinks that it's, it's fundamentally narrow, right? That it's basically... Um, small parts of the U.S., um, it's Japan, and it's Western Europe, and that's that's about it. And so he thinks that there's actually not a lot to be lost there. And, and so he's thinking about kind of future markets for the games and, and making them a truly kind of representative and, and democratic in some ways institution. And, and he sees the Winter Olympics, I think, kind of pointing back to Francesco's question about race as being fundamentally um, exclusive in a lot of ways. So I think, you know, um, I think the Winter Olympics have been pushing to to make that less so, but I, I think pointing back to the beginning of my answer to your question, um, you know, that exclusivity might be built in in kind of um, environmental and, and climatic terms, essentially, right, about where the sport can be practiced and, um, and, and where it can sort of gain this popularity. So yeah, um, I, I guess I would be um, I would be surprised if in three or four decades, the Winter Olympics are sort of at parity in the number of countries uh, competing in the games. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, 
we already have examples of, of Jamaican bobsled teams and um, you know individuals, especially rich individuals from some of these non-skiing countries who essentially live in Switzerland or in Colorado and train and, and become representatives of their countries. I think you know there may be kind of ersatz ways to get there to more countries practicing, but um, you know the difference between um, a Norway and a Mexico um, practicing winter sports, you know, will probably remain pretty large in terms of kind of popular adoption. It's a great question, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Andrew.